Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Zoom into Soil webinar. I'm Jack Cannon and I'm the president of the British Society of Soil Science and I'm really delighted to welcome you to our second webinar of the year and today's event is sponsored by Garden Organic. Um, and before I welcome our speakers and panellists, I'd just like to um, give you a few words about the British Society of Soil Science um, as we're host for, for this webinar. We're an established international membership organisation and a charity, and we're committed to the study of soils in, in its all its widest um, aspects. Uh, we bring together those working in academia and also those um, who are practising soil science um, in industry or implementing it um, in the agricultural sector. And we're also welcome to members who just have a, a keen interest in soils too. Um, so this year in 2023, we'll be hosting nine Zoom into Soil webinars. So do keep an eye on our website for further details um, about the next upcoming webinars. And before we move on to our speakers, I'd just like to say and welcome um, our collaborator on the webinar today, which is Garden Organic. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Bruce Pierce, and he's Director of Science at uh, Garden Organic, and to give a brief introduction uh, about the organisation. So thanks very much for supporting the webinar today, Bruce, um, and over to you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I, I'm Bruce Pierce, I'm the Director of Science from uh, Garden Organic. Um, so we're Garden Organic. Uh, some of you may know us as um, Henry Doubleday Research Association. Um, we're a charity uh, currently based in uh, West Midlands um, and we're focusing on organic growing, composting, citizen science uh, and research, seed conservation. Um, and we want to help gardeners to, to garden in the organic way. Go to the next one. So um, we were. Uh, we're quite an old charity. We were established in 1954 and um, by this gentleman on the left who is Lawrence Hills. And uh, Lawrence uh, wanted to set something up because he was a, um, he was very interested in how do we do more research because things weren't being done and how do we engage people with organic gardening and also solving their own problems. Um, he was quite a modest guy that actually, um, he clearly isn't Henry Doubleday, but he believed very much in what the uh, what Henry Doubleday stood for, and so he set up the uh, Henry Doubleday Research Association in Kent, actually, in 1954, really focusing on things like very. It was very interested in comfrey and what it can be used for, but also um, working with uh, the members to do members experiments. So right from the start, we were doing citizen science um, right from that period. Um, in 1985, we moved to uh, the centre of England, to our current place in Wrighton, which is south of Coventry. And that was uh, really because he wanted to be in the centre of the country to get people, more people to be able to do it, but also being very close to um, what's now part of the University of Warwick, in my time with HRI, Wellsbourne, but was um, the National Vegetable Research Centre where the, the gene bank is. So. Um, we moved to Wrighton and actually we sold Wrighton to Coventry University in 2017 and we're still on that site with an office and there we on this we have uh, our, our garden uh, which is a demonstration garden both of ornamentals and of uh, vegetable growing uh, using organic approaches and also we have the heritage seed library there. Um, the areas, the other areas, we do a lot of work on with community and you'll hear more about it today so we have uh, we do a lot of training and advice uh, members experiments with the citizen science, but also things like master composters, master uh, gardeners, and um, we have a, a, a wide volunteer network around the country which we're looking to expand. So we're working with communities, working with councils, uh, really with anyone who we can um, help get our message out and we work across the UK. If you're interested in wanting to know more about us or get involved with us. So our, our website is uh, gardenorganic.org.uk and click on the get involved and that will take you to um, how to get involved with us. Thank you. That's brilliant. No, thanks. Thanks so much for that introduction, Bruce. It's fascinating to hear um, actually that the uh, your organisation is 
only 10 years younger than the British Society of Soil Science, more or less, actually, and that you're, you know, advocating these sort of bottom-up approaches. So uh, you know, thanks very much, Bruce, for the introduction. Um, and uh, before we introduce our two speakers um, today, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you're probably um, aware that we've muted you because there are there's so many of you on, on the call today. Um, and what we'll do is um, take questions at the end of the, after the two presentations. So please um, uh, post your questions in the, in the questions function. And please can you do that by about 12.50 um, so that we've got um, some time then to, to ask all of the questions for the, for the two speakers. Um, and that just allow us to get through as many as we can to, to respond to those. Um, you'll see that there is a raise hand button, but we, we won't be using that because we'll be, we are, we'll be taking questions at the end of the two presentations, um, unless the presenters decide that specifically that they, well, they want to show of hands and then you can use that during the, during the talks. Um, we, there's also um, CPD points that um, are awarded. So if you're registered with BASIS or NRSO uh, for C uh, CPD, um, please do contact us afterwards um, so that you can uh, receive those CPD points for the event and the email address is there. And as you're probably aware already, um, we will be recording uh, the webinar and uh, it will be available actually on our on the Society's YouTube channel afterwards. And so that's it for the for the housekeeping. So without further ado, um, I'd really like to introduce our, our first um, presenter uh, this this afternoon. And that's Dr. Audrey Lutheran. So uh, just to give you a little bit of information, a bit of a bio. Um, Audrey's a, a practical soils and horticultural specialist um, with a strong background, gained at um, SAC and Aberdeen University. She's director of both um, Audrey Literate Consulting Limited and Earthcare Technical Limited. So she helps clients develop and optimize sort of quality products and byproducts such as composts and anaerobic digestates. Um, she works really closely with, with farmers and land managers to ensure that there's sort of a safe, effective production and use of, of compost, digestates and, and other organic amendments. Uh, she's also interested in restoration of land degraded through um, open cast um, coal mine use. Um, the key interests lie in the practical measurement of soil health which everyone's really keen to, keen to keen to do at the moment in particular, um, and to develop sort of methods to maintain and improve the health of soils, including using organic fertilizers. Um, she's written and contributed to, to many uh, guidance documents on the use of fertilizers and um, organic materials in crofting, particularly in small scales of horticulture and larger scale field agriculture and horticulture, and also in the restoration of, of brownfield land. Um, so Audrey is really passionate about providing people with knowledge and skills uh, to grow top um, quality produce locally as well. So uh, it'd be, I'm really fascinated to hear your talk, Audrey. So over to you. Thanks very much, Jack. That was quite an introduction. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Y yes, that's you... fine. That's, yeah. yeah, that's showing okay. fine, thank right. you. That's fine. Okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, compost and composting. Um, there's certainly plenty of myths surrounding the composting process. There's a lot of art in it. Uh, there's a lot of science in composting as well. Um, so although it is a completely magical process, as far as I'm concerned, um, one of nature's miracles, I think I'm going to try and put a bit of science into it too. So to summarise, I'm going to be, first of all, a couple of definitions, which is quite important, really, as you'll, you'll hear. Why make compost? How to make co good compost? And I'm going to try to concentrate on that. I'll mention briefly the financial and value of composts, which is, can be considerable, and very briefly also the benefits of compost to soils and how to use them to best effect. So to start off with, a bit of confusion, really. Um, in the UK, the word compost has got two completely different meanings. And uh, for gardeners, I often find that, that, that this leads to a lot of confusion, a lot of mistakes, um, heartache, frankly, um, poor germination, poor plant growth, by not understanding exactly the difference between the meaning of those two words, um, for those, those uh, two meanings for the word compost. So true compost, let's start with that. This is the first meaning. This is, this is, this is what I call compost. 
and I try not to use the other um, to use the word compost for the other meaning, but this is what I mean by compost. True compost is made by a composting process, so I'll define that, but it's a stabilised, sanitised organic material made from organic wastes, and crucially, it's rich in a very wide range of beneficial microorganisms. And importantly, it's a fertiliser. It's also a soil conditioner. Now, it can also be a, a, a top dressing for turf, um, but only the very best ones, only the very best composts, true compost, can be used as a constituent of a growing medium. Now, I'm going to describe what I mean by growing medium in a second. So the benefits of using this true compost in agriculture and field horticulture, um, they're extensive, well-documented and, and well-known. So what I mean by composting, and this can happen at lots of different scales from tiny little scale uh, in, in, in a garden compost uh, situation right up to commercial open windrow composting. So by composting, what I'm meaning is controlled, and it, there has to be a degree of control, aerobic, in other words, with oxygen, the controlled aerobic biological decomposition of biodegradable materials, things like garden wastes, for example, and food waste. And what that's that's achieved through mixing, aeration, and self-generated heating. So there's a mixture of uh, completely natural processes and also processes that we do, things that we do. And those things that we do might be um, by hand, for example, turning compost by hand, or they could be things like shredding, uh, machine turning, and uh, sieving at the end. So you need to do things to, to compost to make it happen. It will happen naturally, but it won't happen quite as well. And sometimes we're talking about open situations or semi-enclosed, and sometimes we're talking about completely enclosed. The problem is the word compost can also be used in the UK to mean a growing medium. So something, in other words, um, usually a bagged substrate, bagged material that you buy in a garden centre, in a poly bag with lots of instructions on the outside saying what it's to be used for. Um, and those kind of composts, and I prefer not to call them compost because it is so confusing, but those kind of composts are used to sow seeds. I call them growing meat growing media really used to sow seeds or strike cuttings or pot on young plants or grow vegetables and salads in for example the problem is the uk gardening media regularly use both meanings of the word compost and many tv and radio gardeners unfortunately seem to either fail to understand the real difference between the two or don't emphasize that difference enough so the two types of compost true compost which you might make in a garden compost heap and growing media are totally different and they are not interchangeable um, which is which creates a bit of a problem so growing media are manufactured usually by blending several constituents to get tailor-made products for specific uses things like seed sowing and cuttings that's the most difficult type of growing media to make really for very very sensitive subjects and then potting on young plants and then potting on older plants um, and then growing greedy feeders, things like vegetables and potatoes, those are the easiest ones probably um, to manufacture, and then growing heaths and heathers and things like that. And these kind of composts, or as I prefer to call them growing media, might be manufactured um, using several different types of constituents. Until very recently, the main constituent was actually peat, which is uh, very good as a constituent of growing media, but it's not, it's, um, it's, it contains very, very, very consistent, very, very uh, little in the way of nutrients. So it's easy to add other things to make it very good for growing on young plants. That is not the kind of compost that we're mainly going to be concentrating on today. And of course, the problem with peat is it's a finite resource. And in fact, it's much better left in the ground. So um, we're trying to, in fact, in England and Wales, they have banned, they're, they're looking to ban the use of peat in horticulture. And they've set targets for doing that and we will follow on with that in, in Scotland, I would say, as well. So other things are typically used for growing media, things like coir, for example, uh, sterilised heat-treated wood fibre. To a lesser extent, we can include in those growing media top quality, specially produced compost of the sort that I'm talking about mainly today. But they cannot be easily, you can't make a growing medium out of a compost because the physical and chemical properties of a good growing medium are critical to its safety and performance 
and the physical and chemical properties of a true compost are very different to what plants need in a growing medium. So why can't we just use garden compost as a growing medium? They look the same um, because garden composts are highly variable depending on the starting material or the feedstock that you're making them from. They're much too salty. They're much too nutrient rich for young developing roots. They often contain too much of a, a type of nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen, which can burn young plant roots. They can have a very high amount of carbon in there, um, which can limit plant growth and development. They're often physically unsuitable for use alone. They drain too quickly. They maybe don't hold enough water or they don't drain quickly enough when they hold too much water. And frequently, however hard you try, compost can contain weed seeds, plant pests and pathogens. Perhaps not so much so with fully accredited composts, composts that are part of uh, are accredited to pass 100 commercial composts, but garden composts will unfortunately contain some of these things. So now I'm going to, con uh, to, to concentrate on what, uh, what I call true composts. Why, why should we bother to make composts out of, uh, for example, garden wastes? And I'm talking about why should we bother in terms of our own garden wastes and possibly even some food wastes? And why should we bother commercially as well? Why, why should we not just dump it all in a, all these wastes in a hole in the ground? Well, composting is an absolutely superb way of recycling wastes into a valuable resource. It's also a, a great way to avoid dumping wastes in landfill, which creates methane, which of course is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, and it wastes costly fertilizer nutrients. And where governments all over the world are trying to get us to um, encouraging us to recycle wastes into resources and uh, reduce the use of finite resources, which have to be specially mined or virgin resources, if you like. True composts are a much cheaper and frankly, I would say much better substitute for bagged fertilizers in gardens, in allotments, but also in, in broad scale agriculture. They're superb soil conditioners. They can help build soil organic matter, which can help sequester soil carbon. And they can also help maintain and enhance soil health. So making compost from waste is basically a win-win. So types of compost, there's lots of different types of composting systems. They basically all effectively do the same thing. Um, so in, in a, you could have open air windrows, which are not covered at all. Um, and that's still the main system in, in the UK uh, on commercial sites or treating garden wastes. If you're treating food wastes or food and garden waste, then you would not, you must by law contain all the wastes and, and it's called an in vessel, in vessel systems. Um, and that would be used for mixed food and garden wastes. But for gardeners, crofters, small scale growers, the best is usually, um, this is just to compost um, garden wastes and agricultural wastes uh, rather than food waste. The best is usually just three or four simple turned or unturned piles or windrows of, of, of green wastes. And you can you can either partially cover those if you want to um, and, and uh, enclose them in bays if that suits. Um, there, a very brief word about regulation here. Commercial compost producers must be accredited with the UK Compost Certification Scheme to the British Standards Institute's PASS 100 publicly available specification. Um, and in England and Wales, also another thing called the Compost Quality Protocol. If their composts are to be classed as products, that is, um, if, if com commercial producers don't accredit to those standards, then they're basically producing something which is termed a waste and uh, they must be applied to land under waste regulations, which is, which is really quite complex. But a small uh, private gardeners don't need to, to worry about any of that at all. You can make and use composts on your own property without further regulation. So how does composting actually work? Well, it's an extremely complex process, totally dependent on microorganisms. And those microorganisms live naturally in the environment and on the organic materials that we're trying to compost. So, so as far as I'm concerned, that is a bit of a miracle. You don't have to add anything. You can 
by, uh, for example, in garden centers and commercially on a larger scale, sort of starter cultures of microorganisms. And um, I won't give any trade names because they all try to do the same thing. They're basically trying to add some bugs and maybe a little bit of nitrogen to kickstart the process. But providing there's enough moisture and oxygen, these bugs are there anyway, and they will begin to progressively break down the organic materials which are in a compost heap. And as time goes on, um, heat is produced as the bugs respire and, and uh, multiply. And then as that heat builds up, um, the material breaks down more, and then it, the whole heap gradually begins to cool over time. And the species of microorganisms which do the job change naturally in a fairly predictable way. So basically, in, in, in summary, what you need is microorganisms which are naturally present you must have oxygen because the composting process is an aerobic process and you must have water but not too much most of those things occur naturally you have to mix the 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 feedstocks or the starting materials in an appropriate way and i'll mention i'll talk a bit more about that in a minute and what you get out at the end is heat during the process which is crucial carbon dioxide and water and you get you get compost but it's this natural heating in the process which is absolutely vital and and this is some something which is sometimes missing in domestic heaps um, and it's the reason why uh, if you've got big coarse woody weeds or plant material that you're worried might be diseased it's sometimes better to not compost that your compost that yourself but send it to a commercial facility for composting but if you're good at what you're doing and you can generate quite a bit of heat in your own smaller pile, it's that heat which kills the plant and animal pathogens, it kills weed seeds, it denatures viruses, it helps break down pesticides and any other contaminants that might be in there. So it's the, the heat is vital to the whole thing. And that's what makes composting different to anaerobic digestion. The kind of, the kind of anaerobic breakdown that happens in a pile of horse manure, for example, or in anaerobic digestion systems, that heat is not there to the same extent. It's much cooler. So this is a sort of um, this is one of the most important slides in the uh, in the in the presentation. Really, what you're trying to do at the start with your feedstocks, the materials that you put into the start of the process, the, the structure has to be right, the carbon to nitrogen ratio has to be right, and the moisture content has to be right. This is basically the golden rule. So you need to, let's look at the left-hand side, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, the materials have to have a certain amount of carbon to the, in, in, in proportion to the amount of nitrogen that's there. So in scientific terms, we're talking about a C to N ratio of 25 to one to 40 to one, somewhere between those two ratios. And that basically means a good blend of high carbon material, things like uh, wood chips, that's arguably one of the best things you can put into a composting process, wood chips uh, or a bit of paper and cardboard for example a dead woody bracken in, in the uh, or brown bracken that's another good one um, and you want plenty of that in relation to a slightly smaller amount probably of green fleshy material things like grass clippings vegetable waste sheep's wool it's very high in nitrogen sheep's wool um, or green bracken for example so that's one thing but it must be open enough in structure to let water go in and air move in. So the size of the windrows or the size of your heaps is quite important. If you've got a small heap, then you want a fairly fine, finely textured set of feedstocks. And if you've got a very large heap, like commercial heaps, you want the structure a bit more open because the weight of the material is, is, is weighing it down on a large size and you want some, you want some, some big air spaces in there. The structure is related to the moisture you need to have about 40 to 60 percent moisture content at the beginning and you'll just find what that feels like on a small scale so certainly nothing that's too wet and uh, nothing that's too dry if it's too dry it won't work properly so most feedstocks or starting materials don't work that well alone so fleshy wet green grass clippings is a disaster and they often cause garden hawk compost heaps to heat up very quickly and then it slumps and the air can't get in and they start to stink. In other words, they start to compost or, or de degrade anaerobically. Um, and high carbon feedstocks need mixed 
because there's too much carbon and quite often too much open structure, um, especially in the case of uh, wood chip. So this is, I'm not going to go through this quickly because I, I don't have time. It's its really in there, this slide, um, to help people to help people who are interested in learning about this in a bit more detail. But this just illustrates that manure, for example, horse manure straight from a stables, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is too low. There's too much nitrogen. It's too wet. It's too dense. It doesn't compost well on its own. Straw, again, not so good. Lots of carbon, which is good. Far too dry, though. And the structure is weak. Um, there's problems also with the one at the bottom, vegetable waste. But if you look at mixed garden waste, typical mixed garden waste might include a bit of woody shredded material, a bit of grass clippings. That's what comes into curbside collected uh, green waste com commercial systems. And it needs a bit of shredding, but other than that, it works very, very well as a feedstock on its own. So a couple of slides here on how to make good compost. Be prepared to put in time and effort. It doesn't happen by accident. I had so many disasters with my, my uh, small scale compost system before I learned how to do it. And we're very good at it now, but it does take effort. Um, you really do need to choose your feedstock carefully. You can layer them if you want. It's better still if you turn it at least twice. So um, consider threading woody feedstocks, for example. So. That's the that was the the turning point for me, or the change. It's not meant to be a pun. It was the the it was a real change for us when we bought a decent garden shredder, um, and started shredding our uh, all of our hedge clippings in the winter time, and then and then using them to mix with grass clippings in the summer, and that works really really well. You've got to ensure the wastes are not are not wet. They've got to be moist but not wet, and this means a big difference really between. Composts that are produced in the west of the UK, which are often too wet and need to be covered, and composts on the far east of the country, places like, like uh, Kent or Aberdeenshire even, um, where, or, or East Lothian, Fife even in Scotland, where the wastes often sit too dry and quite often you have to water your compost heap and cover it to heat, keep the moisture in. Um, so it's, it's something you need to be aware of. You need to make sure that enough get, air gets into, but not too much. Um, and turn regularly. You want to be turning at least twice. I don't have a machine. I just have a husband, and that's who does it. Worth doing. Um, a little bit briefly about the financial value of compost. Fertilizer prices have increased significantly in the last year. Composts, are, whether they're garden compost or commercial, currently worth between nine and 22 pounds a tonne. So farmers are increasingly keen to buy them on a large scale if they can get them for a reasonable price. So very briefly here, I'm finishing off now, the benefits of compost to soils and crops. These are really very well documented. Supply of organic matter, that confers numerous be uh, benefits. Fertilizer replacement value, lots of nutrients, particularly P and K, but a bit of slow release nitrogen and sulfur too supply of trace elements, liming value in some cases, all of this adds up to increased yield, productivity and revenue. An increased soil organic matter, we all know the benefits of in improving soil organic matter, particularly in arable soils, are very well documented. There's lots of benefits there. Improved soil su structure, workability, increased water infiltration, increased biological activity and, most importantly, potentially increased resilience to pests and pathogen attack. And this is the key to reducing synthetic inputs uh, in regenerative farming, improving soil organic matter. So very briefly, this is my last slide, how to use compost to best effect. They contain relatively slow release nutrients. So from that point of view, they're easier to apply safely without nutrient losses to the environment. You can apply them any time of year because there's less risk of you losing uh, nutrients than there is with digestates or slurries, for example, but probably best done in the spring. Typically applied about 10 to 40 tonnes per hectare, and not usually every year. That means only between one and four kilograms per square metre. So a lot of gardeners are rather guilty of over applying. So from that point of view, occasional soil testing on home veg patches is worthwhile, because so many people actually overdo it, particularly the keen gardeners tend to put too much compost on. Thank you for listening. Um, 
opportunity for questions shortly. That's brilliant. No, thank you so much, um, Audrey. Absolutely fascinating um, talk about, I never knew that composting had been used inappropriately. I think we need to start a campaign to use the word appropriately in the media, don't we? So, uh, and really, yeah, that's great. Looking at this bit like Goldilocks, isn't it? It's that magic sort of uh, combination of those ingredients, not too much, not too little of things, but, you know, something in the middle. So really demonstrated that really well. It's great. Um, if you want to ask all some questions, just pop them in the chat and we'll pick up on all the questions um, after our, our next speaker um, has finished their talk as well. So thanks very much, Audrey. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, David Hawkyard. And uh, yeah, he's the, he's the volunteer coordinator for the Norfolk Master Composter Programme. And that's a partnership with Garden Organic, who you heard from uh, at the beginning of the webinar, and Norfolk County Council. And uh, David's embedded in the waste reduction team. So that's really good to see you um, embedded in that team at the, at the County Council and, and responsible for, I think, over um, 80 volunteers in the county who are ambassadors for home composting. So I'm really fascinated to hear about um, what you've been up to with the uh, Master Composting Program. So, like, okay. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Jack. I'll uh, just share my screen. Hopefully that's... Uh... Yep, I can see that. That's fine. Can you see that? Great. I'll just yeah, uh, open perfect. my yeah. notes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yes. Yeah, so, uh, um, so, yeah, thank you very much for uh, um, having me to uh, speak for you. I, like Jack said, I'm a volunteer coordinator for the Norfolk Master Composter Scheme uh, based in Norwich. Um, and uh, in this presentation, <clears throat> I'd like to give an overview of how master composter schemes operate uh, and especially how the Norfolk master Co composter scheme is run and what volunteers get engaged in. And I'll also talk about some of the successes uh, and the challenges and some of the developments ahead. So what is a master composter scheme? Well, it's a program uh, where volunteers are trained as ambassadors for home composting. And master composters encourage people in their local community to start composting at home and offer support to people who are already com uh, home composting, but maybe having difficulties or need a bit of encouragement, or maybe they'd like to improve uh, their composting or try a different method. So the idea of master composters was developed in the USA and in Canada in the 1980s, and Garden Organic brought it to the UK in 2001 uh, with the first scheme in Cambridgeshire. Uh, the Norfolk master composter scheme started in November 2006, and it's a partnership between uh, Norfolk County Council, Garden Organic, uh, and RAP, the Waste Resources and Action Programme. Uh, and since that time, it's been one of Norfolk County Council's flagship waste reduction initiatives. Uh, and in this time, we've trained uh, 335 volunteers who have contributed more than 13 and a half thousand hours of promoting home composting in the county. And uh, yeah, we have around about 80 active volunteers that we uh, support in the county. So this map shows all of the Garden Organic Outreach projects in the UK, including those focused on growing, composting and in schools. And at present we have master composter programmes in Norfolk and Suffolk, uh, Cumbria, Shropshire, Staffordshire and North Somerset. Uh, so the project aims, uh, I mean, they're to reduce the amount of waste collected by councils at home and also taken to their uh, recycling centres. Um, funding for master composter programme usually comes from local waste disposal authorities or waste management companies uh, and in Norfolk that's Norfolk County Council. So why do they want to fund this? Well because organic waste causes all sorts of problems in the waste stream. It's expensive to deal with and has no intrinsic value to offset processing costs. Uh, for example, in Norfolk, uh, the County Council spends around about £650,000 per year on disposing of just the garden waste alone that's brought to its recycling centres by residents. 
Uh, organic waste is not really welcome in landfill, as has been mentioned, as it breaks down anaerobically uh, and produces methane and contributes to the leachate, which uh, you know sinks to the bottom of landfill sites and has to be removed and sent for disposal. Uh, many local authorities are relying on incineration for waste disposal now, but it's not really welcome in energy from waste facilities either. Um, uh, so they incinerate waste to, ex to um, well, extracting energy to drive electrical generation. But um, yeah, yeah, usually the material is just kind of too wet to go in, you know, effectively into that kind of system. And food waste is especially unwelcome. And the government actually has mandated all local authorities to offer separate curbside food waste collections by, well, any time from between this year, 2023, uh, and 2031, depending on what contracts uh, they already have in place. Um, so compositional analysis of residual waste bins shows that about a third could be composted at home. Uh, and that includes garden waste, food waste, uh, you know, cardboard uh, and paper products. Uh, so we, as a volunteer group, we raise awareness of the benefits of composting, uh, all those ones that Audrey talked about. I mean, environmental improvement is a key benefit. So by composting at home, all the emissions from transport and processing of organic waste are avoided. Uh, in Norfolk, for example, green waste is dealt with at three commercial composting facilities dotted around the county, uh, and food waste has to be transported out of the county to Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire for processing. Uh, Norfolk Master Compost is run alongside Norfolk County Council's home composting campaign, which promote, promotes home composting to residents to encourage more people to compost at home and to compost more effectively. Uh, and they also support this with the sale of subsidised compost bins. So RAP found in study that local authority home composting campaigns were much more effective when supported by programmes such as master composters with a lower lapse rate. So where people give up composting if they meet problems and have, have had a bad experience. So how does the uh, programme operate? So well, first of all, volunteers are recruited to attend an induction training course. Uh, they're re recruited through uh, volunteer bureaus, local press and radio promotions, uh, social media, and uh, word of mouth through and local interest groups. And in Norfolk, we aim to train 20 new volunteers each year. So the induction training covers the composting process in detail. All uh, the organisms that are involved, uh, the things that can and can't be composted, different methods of composting, and also how to promote home composting in uh, the volunteers' local communities. Volunteers are then let loose on the public, uh, and I'll talk a, a little bit later about what they do. Um, uh, we use a web-based volunteer management system called Better Impact for managing the volunteers. And this allows volunteers to sign up for volunteering opportunities and also to feedback about their activity. And we uh, continue to support volunteers throughout their time as master composters. Uh, so I said, yeah, volunteers attend a foundation training course. So in pre-pandemic times, this was a two-day face-to-face uh, course, but now we do a blended course, so one day face to face, and then this is backed up by uh, online learning on the Moodle platform, and that tends to go into the background of the projects and what the local authority waste management um, kind of activities are. Um, so then we ask volunteers to commit to spending 30 hours per year promoting home composting, which is only 35 minutes per week. Uh, after which they graduate as a master composter. Uh, volunteers talk to friends, neighbours and colleagues about home composting and make wider links in their communities to promote the message. Uh, as I said, for, uh, volunteers uh, tell us about their activities and this is very important to the project as it allows us to show funders the benefits of the programme and to identify 
and build networks in the county. Uh, to guide volunteers, we have in place volunteer agreement uh, and policies and procedures that volunteers follow. And uh, volunteers get uh, ongoing support and can attend further training days, which again, I'll, I'll talk about uh, in the next few slides. So what do master composters uh, get to help them with their role? So firstly, a manual, and they can choose between a physical folder or an electronic version. In future, we're looking towards the manual being an online resource, again, on the Moodle platform. Uh, they get a, a T-shirt to identify them as a master composter uh, volunteer. Uh, and those shorts in the picture aren't standard issue. Um, the display material we give them, we have a variety of display material that volunteers can borrow, including pull-up banners, example compost bins, and a large range of information leaflets. Uh, two of the most recent acquisitions are a digital microscope with a screen and a photo peat board with uh, three different com compost characters on it. Uh, so these are really useful events for attracting people to the stand. The microscope opens up a new view of compost to people and allows us to show the variety of organisms that are involved uh, in the composting process. And the photo peat board attracts people that might not otherwise visit the stand. Uh, they just come over to have a, their pictures taken, but that gives us an opportunity to catch them and talk to them about home composting. So uh, to keep volunteers up to date with news and developments, uh, we, we have a national newsletter and Norfolk volunteers also receive a monthly email uh, with local news and volunteering opportunities. They also have access to a, a Norfolk directory where they can find other volunteers that live in the, their area, which gives them an op opportunity to build local networks. Uh, volunteers become members of a Garden Organic and as part of the programme, so have access to the members area of our website where they can find a range of fact sheets and information. Uh, and they also have access to Garden Organic's advisory service. Um, in, and in Norfolk also we have a connection obviously to the waste reduction team. Um, so uh, volunteers find that really useful for kind of background information that they might need on weight wider waste and recycling issues. And finally, they have a, a dedicated coordinator like, coordinator like myself for advice and support during the time as a volunteer. Uh, we also offer in-service training to volunteers, and this can include face-to-face uh, -face sessions. For example, we run refresher training in the spring uh, and subjects such as alternative composting methods, soil health, uh, and presentation skills as well. Uh, we also run a, a, a series of national volunteer webinars open to all garden organic volunteers. So in the past we've had um, presentations about Bakashi from the company Agriton who, who produce commercially produce uh, Bakashi equipment and bran uh, and wormeries from the urban worm farm um, and subjects such as community engagement and community composting. And we also incorporate a social aspect into the training. Uh, so for example, we, we recently visited Wild Ken Hill where the BBC Two's watches are filmed, uh, uh, spring watch and um, uh, autumn watch and winter watch. Uh, and we heard about their regenerative farming practices and, and also their uh, composting method. Uh, and we also take volunteers to visit a commercial compost site because uh, where, where, as Audrey's mentioned, they do this on a huge scale at high temperature. Um, so, but it does have some useful parallels with home composting that the volunteers can learn from. So what do master composters do? Uh, well, the activities listed here are what volunteers tell us they're doing in the annual national volunteer survey that we undertake. So the most common activity is just informal chats uh, with uh, uh, neighbours and family and friends. And, and this gets into the real nitty gritty of composting. Uh, attending public events is very popular too. Uh, and this can be anything from a large, you know, like a county show 
uh, just to having a stand at a school, uh, the local school or a village fete. Uh, local press is also important, as is an online presence. So volunteers get involved in writing uh, writing um, articles and magazines and also blogging. Uh, in Norfolk, we have a number of volunteers who give talks. And during the pandemic, we ran a, a successful series of webinars uh, after some training and support on Zoom. Uh, we also have volunteers who have made links with schools and care farms in the county, uh, and they go and help them uh, with both growing and composting uh, activities. Uh, we've also had volunteers as part of community composting schemes in the past, although they are uh, tending to struggle in Norfolk at the moment. So just a few of the successes. I mean, I think mainly it's that we've just built up a, a resilient and enthusiastic network of volunteers in the county. Uh, the pandemic was a difficult time for volunteer networks all over, uh, but we are now seeing an increase in levels of activity. Um, uh, Pre-pandemic, we ran a series of 14 workshops in Norfolk each year um, for residents wanting to start composting or, or improve their composting, which were really popular, both with the volunteers and the residents. And then during COVID, we switched to online webinars, uh, and these uh, proved equally popular. We ran a series of 24 webinars in 14-month period. We had over 360 uh, residents attending those. Um, so the challenges, I mean, funding is always a challenge for, for uh, these programmes uh, and we're blessed in Norfolk with a funder who values working with volunteers uh, and the added value that they bring. So Norfolk County Council have contracted Garden Organic to deliver the Norfolk Master Compost programme until 2027 uh, and possibly for another five years after that uh, in, in principle. Um, so, uh, but we've found this hard to replicate when local authority budgets are so squeezed. Uh, measuring impact uh, is, is always a difficulty. I mean, home composting has never figured in national recycling rates uh, because the quantity of material composted at home and so diverted from the waste stream isn't directly measurable. Uh, and the amount of compostable waste in the waste stream varies from year to year. So it's not really possible to gauge it that way by looking for a reduction there. So we tend to look at volunteer activity as a measure of success uh, and, the, and the number of subsidized compost bins that are sold each year. Uh, volunteer recruitment and retention is a, again a challenge, especially during the pandemic, but by giving volunteers a good, well-supported uh, opportunity to get involved, uh, this challenge can be met. Um, so, uh, sorry, um, so in the last uh, year, we've been piloting a scheme in Norfolk uh, called FACET, uh, which offers uh, to support small businesses in the tourist industry in Norfolk uh, to compost their food waste. So this has involved places like bed and breakfasts, uh, and cafes and uh, small food shops. And the uh, plan is to link them up with a local master composter to offer ongoing support. Uh, we're also involved with the Norfolk Green Care Network, which is about connecting people with nature uh, as a way of boosting mental and physical health. And the network's primary aim is to support its members and others to connect with each other to explore uh, kind of potential working relationships ships and uh, share expertise and resources. Uh, we're also hoping to develop a national volunteering scheme. Uh, we often have people um, uh, that get in touch with us from other parts of the UK we, where we don't have a programme. Our aim would be to offer a volunteer opportunity uh, to anyone in the UK and be able to offer training and support to facilitate that. So uh, that's uh, uh, Master Composters. If you'd like any more information about the programme, uh, this is our contact details. So thank you very much. That's brilliant. But thanks very much, David, for giving us a really comprehensive overview of the programme. It's really important to think, you know, to, 
to encourage people to sort of reuse their sort of organic waste at home. So uh, it's brilliant. And uh, yeah, I've I've just got a new garden, so I'm really interested in setting up my new compost heap. So I might be um, tapping you up for some ideas. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so thanks everyone. That's um, we've got loads of questions to get through actually. So um, thanks very much to everybody that is. Um, has submitted them already. Um, we've probably got a couple of minutes for you to submit some more. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'd like to welcome back um, Bruce Pierce, um, and he will be monitoring the questions. So he's been seeing what's been coming in um, that you've been sending for our panelists. So um, yeah, I'd just like to hand over to Bruce um, to ask questions of, of both of our panelists. Then, please. Thanks. Okay. So uh, I'll put the first question to uh, Audrey. Uh, so Sam asked, um, he's sort of aware of the skyrocketing fertilizer prices. Some uh, farmers are moving to using compost, manures, digestate, etc., uh, to add nutrients into soil. Um, do you have any data or intelligence on how widespread this might be? On how many? Well, ooh, there it it was um, it was one of the subjects of the annual. A report which was done um, by Waste and Resources Action Programme and, and funded by others sometimes, I think it was funded by DEFRA sometimes, and they looked at where composts were going or at least where accredited composts were going. So there are some surveys which have been done, I think it's pretty much done annually for a good number of years, but I'm not aware that it's been done for a while. Um, and they, I think it used to be about one Around about 1.2 million tonnes of composts went to agricultural land in the UK, but uh, I'm not aware of any any more accurate data than probably about five years ago. Unfortunately, it's something that would be I know a fair bit about it anecdotally because I quite often help certainly Scottish composters find agricultural markets for their material, and certainly. Oh, I would guess probably at least 50% of the compost produced in Scotland go to agriculture. I'm not so sure about the data in England, but um, yeah, it's a shame that we don't have a better up-to-date record of exactly what, what's going on. Right? Data's at least five years old. Okay. Um, David, I think there's a couple here that, um, are there incentives for consumers, citizens, to actually engage with this from local authorities, council left, tax rebates, or um, cost mitigation strategies, those sort of things? Um, I think the only thing that the, that, comp, uh, that local authorities do tend to offer mo across most of the county, a, a subsidised access to subsidised compost bins. Um, so for example, you can get in Norfolk, you can get like a, 220 litre plastic Dalek type compost bin for £10 uh, and two for £15 plus delivery. And they they've also support things like Bakashi uh, composting. But um, but I think that's as far as it goes really with, you know, with supporting residents in their composting efforts. And, and also if people sign up to the composting scheme, do they gain, gain use of the microscope for the use on stalls and that sort of thing? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. We, I think we'd, we'd probably want to keep uh, keep that yeah. um Yeah, sorry, safe. I won't. Well, <laughs> sorry, it's just right. Okay, um, so, uh, and the other thing that's come up a couple of times is about wood chip. Um, as a compost ingredient, is the carbon sufficiently available for microorganisms for them to utilize in the time scale used in the composting. And then there was another one about, uh, that, uh, about would it be better to use as a, uh, a, a mulch rather than in the compost? Uh, Audrey? Well, first of all, I would refer you, if, if you really are um, a bit nutty about wood chip, which some of us are, I certainly am, but I'm not quite as enthusiastic and excited about it as, as Ben Raskin, who's written a fantastic book about wood chip, which I can highly recommend. Um, but uh, I, be very wary if you're putting raw wood chip onto land directly. Um, lots of people do it. And if you put fresh wood chip, particularly wood chip from uh, coarser branches, you can end up locking up the nitrogen, which you really don't want to be doing uh, in vegetable gardens or fruit gardens. Maybe you do want to do that in, say, shrub borders, where you can cut the weed growth. It's not natural. It doesn't happen in nature. 
and therefore I don't recommend it. I think you can end up attracting the wrong sort of fungi if you do that in ornamental borders in a big way. You can end up attracting honey fungus. What I do absolutely love is using wood chip in, in, in my compost. In fact, that is the key uh, to me that transformed my composting from something that I did kind of not badly to something that I now do extremely well. So the, the, the chip size is crucial. And also you're better to use what Ben Raskin describes as ramiel wood chip, which is wood chip from fairly small branches rather than shredded wood from great big enormous mature trees. So use wood chip from branches up to about five or six centimetres maximum in size. And in a garden compost heap, the kind of shreddings which come out of a garden shredder of typical hedge clippings, for example, they are like rocket fuel to my composting process. So it seems to be just about the right size. I think it was, it's an uh, electric shredder, um, can't remember the size in terms of horsepower, but it's the kind of thing that people would normally buy for a garden. It's a bigger one of that, sort of three or 400 pounds worth of shredder probably. So you have to be fairly keen, but it means that we have very little garden waste going off site and the compost is shred, the, sorry, the wood chip is shredded to particles of about, between about a millimeter and a centimeter in size. Now, I normally used to say to people, make sure you compost for at least a year in a garden setting because most people are simply not good enough at getting the heat for a shorter process. Well, my composting process, using that wood chip, and it's the wood, the compost feedstock is probably about 50% wood chip. And then the rest is made up of grass clippings, herbaceous plant clippings and food waste, or, you know, not, not meats, but, you know, vegetable peelings and stuff. I compost in about nine months and the compost is phenomenal so it's possible to do that wood chip is the key I believe that okay. and regular turning <laughs> okay and then there's two sort of associated so um is composting uh warmer or heat enough or to actually neutralize all pesticides and then there was a comment about uh, the use of um, cardboard and does it deal with the ink? Um, the first question, um, it's not the heat that breaks pesticides down, it's the microorganisms that break pesticides down. And if you're concerned that there's pesticides in your compost heap or in, in commercially produced compost, which th th there can be, I mean, there, there will be in very small concentrations. If you're concerned on that score, then I would leave the compost for at least a year. All organic compounds, even the most recalcitrant ones, will break down in time, but it can take a very long time in the case of some particularly persistent herbicide, like aminopyrrolid and chlorpyrrolid. I don't, those are not available singly to amateur gardeners, but they are to farmers, and there have been some incidences where composts containing I mean, a pyrrolid have been used on allotments and they have caused problems. So if you're concerned about that, then it's the cool temperature microorganisms that tend to break those down over quite long periods of time. So do be leaving your compost for a bit longer. And what was the other question, Bruce? Uh, really was about cardboard and the issue with ink on the cardboard. Yeah, um, I do not ever put that kind of cardboard into my compost heap. I use it to light my fire. So, and li living in the Highlands of Scotland, we have wood burning stoves, so I use it to light my fire. If, if, if there's ink on cardboard, I don't tend to put it into a compost heap. I do think that most of them do break down over time. You certainly never ever see them in the finished product if you've got a good composting process working well. But personally, I don't take the risk. So the kind of cardboard that I put in would be uh, brown cardboard with no... So even with, uh, you often will just get a a title or something across that with, with ink is that it would you be content with that that would be okay to go in yeah i would okay. yeah i know for organic standards you're not allowed to use that but i, I accept that's correct it. yeah that's okay. that's that's absolutely right yes so if i've got the choice i'd pr probably prefer to use it to light my fire or put it to commercial recycling and take I, i'm fussy about it i take the i take the cell tape off when the staples out and all the rest of it i know not everybody wants to do that but again i would never put those into the compost heap Okay, uh, David, uh, what's your thoughts on uh, vermiculture and or composting with invertebrates, uh, creation of, a two, uh, of two value added products versus one, mix, one of mixed perceived value? So 
how do you perceive the value of vermiculture? Uh, um, well, I think so. Small scale wormeries that we kind of uh, uh, use in home composting. I think they are excellent. Uh, um, so they they're very good at dealing with um, fruit and vegetable waste from your kitchen. Um, they're also good for people uh, who have limited space. Um, so, you know, you can run a wormery on a balcony or if you've just got a shed or, um, so I think that's where the, the main benefit lies, where if, if, you, if you're um, uh, rather stuck for room, you can use, you know, a wormery vermiculture. And you, you can also um, take off the liquid uh, leachate that comes out of the bottom of a, a, a wormery and use that, you know, diluted as a, as a plant feed, which is quite a useful addition. Um, yeah. So. Yep, thank you. I have another one I'll, I'll put to you. So I have a couple of local authority plastic compost bins, black garlic types. I find the compost accumulates lots of worms which migrate to the top of the bin and lodge under the bin lid. Substrate is mainly garden waste, kitchen veg, fruit waste, shredded paper. I suspect the mixture gets anaerobic at base, so I'm, am I correct in thinking that the worms migrate upwards to escape this and uh, perhaps excess ammonia? Yes, it could be. I think, I think there's, I mean, I don't know whether Audrey's got a view on this. I mean, there's, worm behaviour is a really odd thing. You, you sometimes can't say why worms gather at the top, but they all tend to. I mean, it could be that they're moving out of some area of the compost bin that is uh, that's just not suitable for them. Um, uh, they, they could be uh, get, getting up into the top of the bin where it's a bit warmer just to kind of to warm up. Um, I, I don't think it always means that there's a problem in your bin. And, and the thing about uh, like open compost bins like that, the worms can move out to different areas and, you know, let the composting process by microbes go on and then they move back in and do the final maturation of the compost. Um, so it, it doesn't always, it doesn't necessarily mean a problem. And the fact that you've got loads of worms in your compost heap is probably quite a good, you know, a good thing that you're just seeing them there. Okay. Um, sorry, there's stuff coming in quickly. Um, Many, warm, many lawn weed killers do present a problem in compost and produce la uh, and product labels uh, warn about being grass clippings can be included in the compost. Uh, so if you're using weed killers, don't compost your, well, I would say don't use your weed killers, but actually don't, <laughs> don't compost your, your, your cuttings. Correct? Uh, absolutely. Correct. Yeah. No, 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 don't be using, I mean, weed killers like MCPA, Me Mecapop, Dicamba, they, they're all present in things like feed and weed available to amateur gardeners. Never put that material in your compost heap because it will have an impact on non-target organisms. What you're trying to kill is your grass weeds, you know, things like buttercups and dandelions. Um, if you do have, uh, if you have used that type of material, then uh, definitely do not, do not ever put it in your garden compost. In fact, I would leave it for at least three grass cuttings before you start put it, returning your grass clippings to your compost heap. And I would, I would say um, embrace these flowers that attract pollinators. Embrace them. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have to say I don't embrace the moss in mine. <laughs> moss doesn't. If you so, so I, I, we scarify to take the moss out, and we found that, uh, and the moss comes out perfectly easily without moss killer. But uh, we've got a really powerful scarifier. But that moss is incredibly resistant to breakdown. Mm. So we use that as a mulch for yeah. weeds in places that we don't want weeds. But we don't put it in the compost heap because it kind of seems to slow down the compost heap for whatever reason. It's very resistant to breakdown. There's always no a need for something, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Right. Um, your hanging <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Water retention is brilliant for that. So, uh, no, great. Um, I'm really sorry to draw that to close. There's clearly lots of interest from from everybody in the audience. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for for all of those questions. Really fascinating. And you know, on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, and you know, I'd really like to thank you both um, Audrey and, and David for presenting today, and, and also Bruce for expertly guiding those questions. There are obviously lots of questions coming in. 
Um, and you know, another uh, final thanks to the, the our um, sponsors there, Garden Organic, for supporting the the webinar today. So thanks very much to the three of you. It's been it's been really fascinating. I've learned lots as well. Um, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, you'll find when you exit, there's a quick feedback survey. Please do take time to complete that. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available, and um, so you can watch it again. Um, it will be on our YouTube channel. Um, the next webinar that we have is on another absolutely fascinating subject. This one's going to be brilliant as well, uh, on microplastics um, in soils, and that's on Wednesday, the 5th of April, same time. Do check our website for, for other events and also some of the other Zoom into soils coming up. So, yeah, hope to see you at future events. And in the meantime, thanks very much and see you again. Bye.